When people get past the age of 60, 65, a lot of them develop heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases, cancer. Is that inevitable? So what would be your anti-inflammatory diet? Let's start to break it down. If we want to, well, because I think what you said is so important is that all diseases of aging and all chronic illness is really inflammatory disease at some level. Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, I think it starts with what you don't eat because the mainstream American <laughs> diet is strongly pro-inflammatory. It gives yeah. us the wrong fats you know, the wrong kinds of carbohydrates and not enough of the protective elements, which are mostly in fruits, vegetables, or spices. So the first rule is to stop eating refined, processed, and manufactured food. You know, yeah. that's simple. I mean, that's really what's doing us in. Yeah. So see if you can eliminate that from the diet. And then- I remember, I remember once before you go on, I remember you on Larry King once and I heard you say, the two things that I would recommend to everybody, non-negotiable, are get rid of high fructose corn syrup mm -hmm. and trans fats. And I stole it right. from you because yeah. it was so brilliant. And I'm right. like, if you, if you do that, basically, you get rid of a lot of the junk out there. Well, the trans fats have mostly been phased out, but we now have, you know, our, our manufactured food is flooded with uh, refined vegetable oils, which are sources of pro-inflammatory fatty acids. And they're in there mm -hmm. because we've made them cheap through federal subsidies. Same with high fructose mm -hmm. corn syrup. So that has to change. And uh, mm -hmm. But the first step of the anti-inflammatory diet is eliminating as much as possible those kinds of foods. Then you yeah. want to eat a wide variety of produce. And I think mo more concentrate on vegetables than fruits because fruits can be concentrated sugar sources. But you want to eat a great variety of vegetables of all different colors. Those all have protective elements in them. Same for herbs and spices. Uh, the mm -hmm. most powerful natural anti-inflammatory agent is turmeric, uh, the yellow spice, ginger, yeah. which is related also. But those are, uh, you know, tea, green tea. At the top, very top of my anti-inflammatory pyramid is dark chocolate. Uh, <laughs> <which> <laughs> you mean your personal are, pyramid or is this, is this actually? Everyone, my pyramid, I recommend. <laughs> no, no, ch dark chocolate in moderation has uh, a lot of protective compounds in it. Yeah. And then I don't believe that carbohydrates are bad foods as, as some of the extreme keto and paleo people believe. Yeah. I think you have to learn which carbohydrates are better and which are worse. And in general, the ones that quickly digest into blood sugar and raise blood sugar, and that's mostly things made from flour uh, or containing sugar, those are not good. They promote inflammation. That's Whereas right. slow digesting carbohydrates like you find in beans and, and the winter squashes and sweet potatoes, no, those are okay. Um, yeah, and even like vegetables, like asparagus is a carbohydrate, Our, right, artichokes are carbohydrate, exactly. broccoli yeah. is a carbohydrate. Right. So <laughs> they're, they're actually, you know, I, I joke and I say carbohydrates are the most essential thing we need for health and longevity because that's where yeah. all the phytochemicals are, right? Right, right. It's, it's, it's not the garbage carbohydrates that we're all eating. Yeah. I was talking to uh, Dan Butner the other day, the Blue oh, Zone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love him. He, we were talking about beans, you know, which have been really vilified in the, in the keto uh, yeah. paleo world. And he said that one of the common threads that they've seen in all the blue zone areas is regular consumption of beans. You know, yeah. they're, they're good foods. They're cheap. Uh, they're available. They have a lot of fiber, a lot of uh, minerals, a lot of phytonutrients, a slow digesting carbohydrate they have, yeah. and protein. They have everything to recommend them. It's true. I was in Sardinia last summer at one of the blue zones ah, and Dan hooked, yeah. Dan hooked me up and I had this great adventure. And, you know, one of their core staple foods is minestrone which is filled with beans and vegetables. Right, you know? right. It's, like, <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. Really good. So, so it's, and it's also getting an oil change, right? You also talk about getting an oil change. Yeah, big uh, one. Because I, think I, the, I think I stole that from you too. <laughs> that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> well, I'm a big fan of olive oil, you know, which, which not only is delicious and has good fatty acid profile, but it has a unique anti-inflammatory compound in it that's not mm. found in other oils. Uh, so I think that's, you know, should be your main, uh, cooking oil. If, if it's also wanna, antiviral. It's yes, like a, if, true. And if you want an oil that doesn't have a flavor of olive oil, my first choice would be avocado oil. Yeah, that now has become affordable and it's got a good fatty acid profile. High exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you need so, everyone needs an oil change. And omega three fats. You talk a lot about and omega three fats. Absolutely, which probably are best gotten from the fish sources rather than taken as supplements. But they're, the diets, mainstream diet is very deficient in omega-3 and very yeah. heavy in omega-6s. which So are, sardines which to, and mackerel and herring and the small, the small fish, right? <laughs> yeah. And sar sardines, I, I'm a big fan of kippers, smoked kippers, which you oh, get yeah. in any supermarket. I mash them yeah. with mustard and onion and lemon. Yeah. They're great. Yeah. And they're cheap. You know, this is a cheap, high quality food, good source of mm -hmm. omega-3 fatty acids.
Yeah, so true. All right, so nutrition is pretty clear. We need to get rid of the bad stuff, put in good stuff, and add these protective foods. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about what not to eat, but you're also talking about what to eat, which is really important, and which is yeah. it's not just what to eliminate, but it's actually the protective nature and some of these foods that we don't typically have. And I know when I go to the grocery store, I think of it as my pharmacy with an F. Mm -hmm. And I literally go through with a mind of like, because I understand what the phytochemicals are and I've studied this, I can literally go through and say, oh, I'm gonna about this drug and this drug and this drug. Okay. That's oh, great. This is a prebiotic and this is a probiotic food. And this has, you know, high levels of catechins and this has high levels of cur curcuminoids and these are high, high levels of gingerols. And I'm, I'm thinking all the time about how do I yeah, actually optimize great. my biology by getting my medicine cabinet, otherwise known as my fridge, full of the right <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned probiotics, and this is, I think, another area of tremendous revolution in medical thinking. When I was mm -hmm. in medical school, people who took, uh, who ate yogurt or took <laughs> acidophilus were health nuts. You know, this was, we were yeah. made fun of. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly now we're seeing that the gut microbiome is a major determinant of physical health, of mental health, of your interactions with the environment. I mean, this is re remarkable research that's being done. Um, yeah. and, and then it's worth thinking about, and what can you do to modify your gut microbiome in a good direction? It seems like one of the best strategies is to eat fermented foods. And, yeah. uh, I recommend learning to make them because they're, you know, I make my own sauerkraut and pickles and kimchi. Yeah. It's fun. And these are cheap foods and, uh, they're delicious and they really do good things for your insides. It's true. I used to make my own yogurt in college. My daughter now makes mm -hmm. kimchi and I'm like, great. Am I really going to eat that? It's a little, I'm like, I'm a little nervous, you know, homemade stuff is like, yeah. <laughs> it's going to kill me. But my daughter's now in medical school and it's so, it's so oh, fascinating great. to, to actually see how little the curriculum has changed yep. and how anachronistic yep. it is and how yep. they're teaching literally 19th and 20th century medicine, which is very reactive mm -hmm. and, and, and doesn't understand this basic fundamental question that you really called us to think about, which is how do we create health? And still short changes nutrition, you know, which if it is taught, is taught as biochemistry and is forgotten as soon as the biochemistry exams are done yeah. and uh, still omits mind-body interactions, doesn't yeah. teach about, you know, what these other medical systems have to offer. So big, big need for change. And that's what our center tries to do. You know, we are remedying all the things that are not taught. That's so uh, powerful. So, yeah. so talk about how, how do we start to think about defining health? How do we measure health? How do we create health? How have you used both food and mind-body practices and other alternative modalities to help activate the healing that you say we all are possibly have access yeah, to without knowing it? First of all, it's hardly a new idea. Hippocrates t said we should revere <laughs> the healing power of nature. I mean, that's, oh, yeah, uh, this, that was his first precept. So, um, uh, to me, when I ask mo many medical colleagues to define health, a, a common answer I get is the absence of disease. And that's not very helpful. You know, I think health is a positive state of balance, equilibrium, wholeness, uh, and a major quality of it is resilience so that you can go through mm -hmm. life and not get thrown off balance by all the things out there that have the potential to harm, harm you. You know, it is remarkable that most people are mostly healthy most of the time when you think about all the things that can go wrong, both, <laughs> true. both within the body and outside the body. I mean, yeah. it is marvelous and we never stop to think about that. Yeah. And it, as you said, it's absolutely true that most diseases end by themselves. Uh, yeah. in, and they end because the body's healing mechanisms take care of them. And we can take credit for that, but it's not, not usually our doing. Um, and I would love to see a course at the beginning of medical school on the healing system of the human organism. You mm. know, I didn't learn anything about that. You know, it is, it makes use of the immune system, the nervous system, circulatory system, yeah. but there are these internal healing mechanisms that keep mm. us in balance. And that's good medicine should start from thinking about, you know, what, why isn't healing happening here? What can we do yeah. from outside that might facilitate it, you know, remove obstacles to it? That, that seems to me is our main job. It's true. And I think, I think most people don't realize there is a healing system in the body. Absolutely. There is actually yeah. our innate mechanisms for repair, regeneration, renewal, fighting infection. It, it exists and we see it, right? I mean, if we, we cut our skin, it You heals. cut your skin. It's, <laughs> it's easier to talk about this with kids than it is with doctors. You know, watch what happens when you get an owie and that yeah. same thing happens throughout the body. Yeah. And so, my so, experience is that most people have no confidence in that. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the great things we can do for people 
uh, if we understand that, is to give them greater confidence in their body's healing abilities so that they can be less dependent on practitioners of all sorts. So, so can you break down what are the elements of our body's healing system so people understand what we're talking about? <clears throat> well, clearly the immune system is central to that. You know, that's that's our uh, you know our major defense system, which protects us against uh, infection and and uh, pathogenic organisms and cancer and foreign things that can harm us. Uh, but I think the nervous system is is key that regulates the immune system. The nervous system connects to the mind, and you can't separate the mind from the body. Um, and there are all sorts of ways that what goes on in our mental, emotional sphere influences what happens in our physical sphere. So it's all connected, but this is, you know, yeah. at any level of biological organization that you look at, you see inherent mechanisms of repair, even in the DNA molecule itself, mm -hmm. which if it's injured, begins to make repair enzymes to correct it. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot, some, one of your books was on healthy eating, on mm -hmm. how, how do we eat? And, and it was a huge influence on shifting my thinking on what to take out of my diet, what to put into my diet, what to, how to rethink what we should be eating and how food is medicine. Um, and that, that is a huge component of activating our healing system. Absolutely. And uh, you had asked me some questions about inflammation and its importance. And you know that I've developed an anti-inflammatory diet, yes. an anti-inflammatory pyramid. And, uh, you know, this to me is one of the great revolutions in medical thinking. Mm. Uh, when I was in medical school, I was taught that diseases like uh, coronary artery disease and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and cancer were completely separate disease entities that had nothing in common. Yes. And now it turns out that they may have a common root in inappropriate chronic low-level inflammation. Mm -hmm. You know, coronary artery disease begins as inflammation in the lining of arteries. Alzheimer's begins as inflammation in the brain. And cancer is connected also because anything that increases inflammation stimulates cells to divide more frequently. Yep. And you can't separate those two things. Anything that is, is pro-inflammatory is also uh, drives malignancy. So mm -hmm. the good news is that if all these disease processes, which are the big things that kill and disable people prematurely uh, have a common root, then there's common strategies for dealing with them. And that is to contain inappropriate inflammation. Inflammation is a critical function of the body. You know, it's critical to healing. It's the way the body gets more immune activity and nourishment to an area that needs it. And we all know it on the surface of the body. It's local heat, redness, swelling, and pain. Yeah. But <clears throat> it's very important that inflammation stay where it's supposed to stay and ends when it's supposed to end. If it doesn't, yeah. it becomes productive of disease. And uh, this is a problem I think many of us go through life in a pro-inflammatory state. There's lots of influences on that, but diet is a big one, and it's one that yeah. potentially we have, a, have control over. Yeah, so I think that's really true. I, I remember uh, uh, recently I had, a, I had a patient who had an autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. and uh, she said, Dr. Hyman, would you mind talking to my rheumatologist about, you know, what my care is about. And I was searching for the causes of inflammation. Was it her diet? Was it her microbiome? Did she have a latent infection? You know, what mm -hmm. were the triggers? And, and I was like, oh, you know, you get those calls you're like, oh, this doctor, he might, it's going to be an argument. He's not going to get it. It's a waste of my time, but I'll do it. I get on the phone with the guy and he's a cedar Sinai rheumatologist. And he's like, oh, Dr. Hyman, I've been using the anti-inflammatory diet with my patients. You have no idea Great. how well it works. Fabulous. <laughs> I'm like, Great. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> like, and I, I think there's a sort of a shift in doctors understanding this. You've got like William Lee writing the book, yeah. Eat to Beat Disease. And there's a really increasing understanding that food is, is not just calories, that it's actually medicine, it's information. And, it, and the molecules in there, the phytochemicals, I mean, that was your original yeah. work was understanding ethnobotany and yeah. the power of plant compounds that to actually regulate our biology. And, yeah. and nowhere is that more important than food. And I don't think people grasp the power of food to actually not only prevent disease, but actually to treat and reverse disease. Yeah. And rheumatology is made to order for integrative medicine. It's uh, those diseases. <laughs> first of all, they have a high tendency to go into remission, which is great because mm -hmm. uh, you can take credit for that. Uh, they're, they're, the mind-body component is, hits mm. you in the face. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a typical story of the onset of rheumatoid arthritis in a young woman is flare up of all joints within 24 hours of a serious emotional trauma. Yeah. Uh, and then there are these influences of diet. There are many natural remedies. So integrated, you'd think that integrative rheumatology would be a really robust field. It is slowly coming into being. 
You know, yeah. we've had a number of rheumatologists go through our fellowship and they're interested in working together. So I hope one day that'll be, yeah. you know, bef before we immediately turn to these very powerful immune suppressive drugs, uh, we should try these lifestyle adjustments and, and see how we can modify those diseases. Yeah. And, and, and I think people don't realize that there, there are ways to figure out the cause of inflammation. You know, I had a patient who, who uh, did an elimination diet uh, as part of reading my book, The 10 Day Detox, yep. uh, which is essentially getting rid of you know, a lot of inflammatory foods and uh, gluten was one of them. He's like, Dr. Hyman, is it possible that my rheumatoid arthritis can go away in 10 days? <laughs> and I'm like, well, yes, if it was something you're eating, you uh -huh. know, and, and for him it was. It's not, not all the causes of rheumatoid arthritis are the same. It could be a parasite, it could be gluten, it could be a Lyme disease, it could be very- Environmental serious. toxins. Environmental also. toxins, right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they call those autogens, which drive inflammation. Right. right. You know, you know, you you um, you influenced me highly, and there was another physician that actually I met that that actually ended up writing me a letter of recommendation for medical school named Bernie Siegel, uh, who, <laughs> sure. who you know well. Yeah, uh, and he wrote a book called Love, Medicine, and Miracles, mm -hmm. and he was a cancer doctor. Yep, who wrote about all sorts of extraordinary stories and cases of the power of the mind to heal the body, and talked about basically the pharmacy between your ears. Yep. Uh, and, and another good friend of yours, Ted Katrip, also yep. wrote a really wrote a book called The Web and the Weaver about Chinese medicine, yep. but he then went on to study the placebo effect. Placebo effect. And the no great. Yeah. yeah. And, and the nocebo effect. And so, you know, we don't really think about this when, when we're in our clinic with patients. We talk about stress and, you know, maybe you should meditate and it's kind of given lip service. But, you know, when you actually look at the power of this and guys like Joe Dispenza are taking it to another level, which is a little bit of a mystery to me, but you hear these stories and like, wow. And your book, Spontaneous Healing, is full of these stories. So can you share a little bit about your yeah. understanding of this mind-body effect, how it works, and how to activate it, and what people can do to actually make it part of their daily life? You know, first of all, I would say Bernie Siegel, I think, was ahead of his time and what did not get a positive reception from the academic medical community, <laughs> no. to say the least. And he couldn't believe, when, when I was doing this at the University of Arizona, he couldn't believe that I was being accepted out there in an academic center, but times had begun to change. Yeah, uh, I took a course in medical hypnosis at Columbia University uh, right when I finished my internship. One of the most interesting courses I've ever taken. Um, you know, it, it was just it was just great, and I and that really awoke in me the power understanding of the power of using mind the mind body connection. So I then also affiliated with a a very skilled clinical hypnotherapist who was uh, mm. on the teaching faculty of the American Society for Clinical Hypnosis and who still uh, teaches on our faculty. And I remember him once saying to me that he thought that all dermatological disease and all gastrointestinal disease should first go to hypnotherapy ah. before you go to dermatologists or gastroenterologists because yeah. those systems are the most frequent sites of expression of uh, stress-related disorders. Uh, anyway, mind-body medicine is a very important part of our curriculum in integrative yeah. medicine. It, so it's hypnotherapy, guided imagery, visualization, biofeedback, I mean, a whole range of these things. Uh, these therapies are very time effective, very cost effective, and very underutilized in medicine today. And they're yeah. even fun for both the practitioner and the patient, but I mean, we don't think of using them. And I think there is nothing that's out of the reach of the mind because everywhere you've got nerves, you've got the potential for, for mental influence. You have to be, there's an art to discussing this with patients because it, as I'm sure you know, that patients can easily think that they're being accused of having imaginary diseases or, or making it all. Or you're up, blaming them all for the in, problem. Yeah, or, or that it's all in the mind, which it isn't. It's always in the mind and the body. But you right. can take advantage of that connection. Yeah, so how, how do you um, understand the biology of spontaneous healing, the biology of the mind-body? Because, you know, there was a, Bernie was great. He, he, he told I the story. I mean, it's funny, we used to write letters back in the day when we had, where there were letters and he used to write me, he was bald and he, he wrote me in a purple, purple pen. And, and he reminded me of like Harold and the Purple Crayon, which is my favorite childhood book. <laughs> but when he talked about the, this, this episode of this woman who had cancer and mm -hmm. they basically told her that they were going to give her this brand new drug that was going to cure her cancer, but it was, it was nothing. It was a placebo and literally her cancer tumor just melted away. And then a number of years later, they, they kind of said, well, you know, that was really just a study and it really wasn't a thing. And her cancer came back like that and she <laughs> died. 
And and so that's that's just remarkable to think about. So it. again, this is another era where I think there's been a, a, a huge change in thinking. Although this still has a ways to go, I yeah. think that the these new uh, brain imaging studies uh, that have become available to look at meditators' brains, for example, mm-hmm. and see physical changes in the brains of people who meditate, or yeah. we use in placebo responses of finding that there are brain correlates of placebo responses, it makes it real for doctors who otherwise thought this was all sort of black magic and, and wasn't real medicine. So I think that's, that's changed things. Now there's now a real serious placebo studies. I think it's being looked at in a different way from the way it used to be. And you know, our friend Candace Pert, who sadly is not here anymore. She wrote a book called molecules of emotion. Yeah. And she identified this whole phenomenon of psycho neuroimmunology, Mm -hmm. which is how our immune system is literally listening to our thoughts and and regulating what's happening and 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 it regulates so many things in our body that we just are beginning to understand like telomeres like elizabeth blackburn's work showing that right. for example meditation can lengthen your telomeres <laughs> right yeah so i think you know that this when i was in that hypnosis course uh there there is a very well documented literature of experiments like uh taking a good hypnotic subject and telling them you're touching them with a piece of hot metal and it's a finger and they get a blister you know, the blister is real and you can do the mm-hmm. opposite. You can touch them with a piece of hot metal and say it's cold and they don't get a blister. I mean, that's all you need to see, you know, of how powerful that connection mm-hmm. is and you want to take advantage of it. Yeah. And, and so how do people listening start to incorporate these practices? What, what, what is your sort of basic go-to instructions for people to say, okay, we have this healing system, you know, our mind can kill us or it can cure us. <laughs> So I just as this as an example of this cancer patient, how do you start to lean toward the curious side of the ledger? Well, first of all, I think everyone should learn and practice some method of neutralizing the harmful effects of stress on mm-hmm. the mind and the body. My favorite mm-hmm. techniques are breathing exercises because they're so time effective and, mm-hmm. and cost effective and efficient. Uh, in addition, um, Here's one strategy that I use. I can't always do it. But if you can, as a physician, introduce a patient to someone who has their disease and is now well, that Ah. is a very powerful way of giving them a message that it's possible to get better. I've had many patients over the years who've said to me in retrospect that the most important thing I did for them was that I was the only doctor they saw who told them they could get better. Yeah. I mean, that makes me sad in a way that why doctors are so pessimistic. Uh, I think it's the okay. cover your ass medicine, which is, you know, don't yeah, promise that, too much. Exactly. Under, pro- under promise and over deliver if you can, but it's, it's, exactly. it's like lower expectations so you don't get in trouble or get sued. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think another, another problem is that um, in our hospital training, we tend to see a very skewed population of sick people. We see very sick people. And in the very sick population, healing happens less regularly than it does in the general population. So I think that skews our view. But the fact is an awful lot of doctors are pessimistic about healing and they convey that in one way or another to patients. <laughs> I had I had atrial fibrillation and ended up having a, a, a an ablation. And the doctor was brilliant. It was, she was world's expert in mm-hmm. atrial fib. And, but she read me the riot act of what was possibly going to happen to me when I had the procedure to surgery done. And I was like a half an hour of terrifying, well, you could die and we could puncture your aorta and we could do this. <laughs> You're this could rupture. And I'm like, Wow, you know, it wasn't exactly inspiring. <laughs> I collect, I collect some of these stories, Mark. You know that I put under the heading of, uh, you know, th- this is uh, medical hexing. Uh, oh. one, one I remember was I had a, a woman patient that had systemic lupus. You know, she was pretty sick, and she worked with a rheumatologist, and mm-hmm. she kept bugging the rheumatologist about what her prognosis was. She must have really exasperated him, and finally he said, "Well, put it this way: I wouldn't buy any tires with a lifetime guarantee." Guarantee. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow. Or yeah, let me no, tell you one good. other. I had a patient from Finland, a woman who had MS, 
And uh, she came to Arizona. She stayed at Canyon Ranch. And just imagine, first of all, the benefit of coming from Finland in the winter and yeah. staying at Canyon yeah. Ranch. Tucson. But, yeah. So she brightened up and she said, you wouldn't believe what those doctors did to me in Finland. She said the head neurologist at the hospital when he made the diagnosis said, wait here. He went out and came in with a wheelchair and asked her to sit in the wheelchair. And oh he said God. he wanted her to get a wheelchair and sit in it for an hour a day to practice oh. for, for when she oh would need God. a wheelchair. Wheelchair wow. practice. <laughs> That's terrible. Not terrible. Oh right. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I mean, you and I have seen great results. And I think part of it is because we, we do believe, one, we believe ourselves in the power of yeah. the healing yeah. mechanisms in the body. And it's actually not really a belief anymore. There's so much science to back it up. Totally. And, and the, the patient then feels that possibility. And then they actually engage with their health more and they start to believe it. And it starts to shift everything. I think that's one of the most important things we can do for patients is to give yeah, them I, I agree. that sense of confidence <laughs> in their body's ability to handle yeah. things. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think the other thing is we're learning about is, you know, our thoughts influence everything, right? Our, mm -hmm. uh, our telomeres, our, yep. our microbiome. Amazing. Right? That, that, yeah. like our, literally those bacteria are listening to your conversations. <laughs> Just like yeah. Alexa, <laughs> and they <laughs> Amazing. and they actually start to change and yeah. grow different bugs or good bugs or bad bugs. So it's so important to get your mindset right. And I think the mindset story is something that we don't tell enough in medicine. We don't teach people how to navigate their thoughts and their feelings. And none of us get any instruction in emotional intelligence. I mean, we learn you know reading, writing, arithmetic, but we don't learn the most important things in life, which is how to have healthy relationships, how to practice, how to create health for ourselves, and how to manage our money. <laughs> <laughs> well, all and, those are key, key components <laughs> of healthy living. And absolutely, this should be, this should be taught. By the way, I think, you know, we should have robust health education starting in kindergarten and going all the way up, you know, through professional education and beginning with the idea that the body can heal itself. Yeah. Well, you know more about how our car works or how our iPhone works and how our bodies right. work for most people. Yep. And I think what you're, one of the, you know, the magnificent things you've done is you've T taught people what the healing systems are in their body from both food and mind body systems yep. and exercise and and many other modalities that the role of plants and herbs and and nutrients in creating healing and and the truth is that most of health does not get created by the doctor it creates created by your lifestyle and the exactly, factors that you have yeah. full control over and that are not that expensive right. uh, and you know sometimes mm -hmm. you need some heroic measures like you know I did you probably might have at some point in your life but thank god for that it's just it's just not where the money is, you know, right now in terms of how we focus on what's important. But like diabetes is the greatest example. It's, it's crippling our economy globally, obesity in, in America and, and obesity and diabetes costs, I think, 3.7 trillion in direct and indirect costs. That's an enormous amount of money. That's like a third of our economy, just that. I mean, I, I mean, sorry, a fifth of our economy, just that. And, and yet uh, it's curable by food and, and, and lifestyle and exercise and stress reduction and all those things. And we don't do anything about it. So, uh, listen to this. This is very, I think, sobering. Uh, mm -hmm. the, a few years ago, the New York Times ran a week-long series on the effect of the diabetes epidemic in New York City on, on oh. the city. And one article was an economic analysis yes. of, of it. So I read they that. Said, it's terrifying. You, okay. For every clinic uh, that offered nutritional counseling or preventive medical counseling for each consult, they lost on average of fifty to a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. For every amputation of a diabetic limb, they made six thousand yeah. dollars. So there's the problem right there. Yeah. You know, prevention doesn't pay. Yeah. And until we can figure out how to make it pay, we, we aren't getting anywhere. The whole system is corrupt. You know, it it is geared toward making money for interventions for drugs. Uh, you know, it is it is not geared toward you know incentivizing people to teach prevention. Yeah, I mean, I think it's starting right. I mean, a value based care is mm -hmm. a concept that says, well, we need to get better outcomes at lower costs, and you need to be accountable for the results. I mean, think about it. If you went to your car mechanic and you gave him your car, but it he didn't fix it and charge you a lot of money. He wouldn't go back to him, but, right? You know, right now we 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 pay for healthcare, even though the results are abominable, yep. and our product disease are escalating, and their costs are escalating. We're not seeing benefit. We should be paying for results, and Absolutely. and that's really what the system is shifting towards. What Medicare is shifting towards. Mm -hmm. The problem is doctors don't know how to produce those results because they just you know are trying to do the same things a little bit better and more efficiently. Uh, but for example, at Cleveland Clinic where I work, you know, they 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 had an accountable care 
system where they were paid a certain fixed amount for diabetes care. So if they, if they get, let's say, $20 million a year from Medicare to cover all their diabetic patients, if it costs them $10 million to take care of them, they make $10 million. If it costs them 30, they lose $10 million. So uh-huh. they're incentivized, but they still don't know what to do. They still don't understand that huh. they should be providing food for the patients like they right. did at Geisinger, where they showed an 80% reduction in cost by giving the patients food as opposed <laughs> to drugs. We'll pay for the, you know, we'll pay for the drugs. We'll pay for insulin and all the medications and the amputations and the doctor visits and the bypasses, but we won't pay for a few dollars worth of food, which is insane. Ha. Ha. Right. Well, I'd love to see all this change. Yeah, I think I think it's coming. I think it's coming. Uh, hopefully, we'll get there. Uh, I want to switch switch gears a little bit and talk about longevity because I, I, yes. I know you wrote a book many years ago called Healthy Aging. Yeah, and uh, and that was honest, honestly way before. Uh, the rest of the world is waking up to these concepts that now are hitting the mainstream around longevity. And, and you've got all the tech billionaires really interested in this now and yeah. putting billions of dollars into longevity research. You've got it being a recognized discipline in science now, where it was sort of a stepchild, but why should we study age and we all get old and we can't do anything about it? And, and I think the truth is we can't. And mm-hmm. I, I just did my biological age test. It's a DNA methylation test. And I'm 62. Uh, I think I was 35 when I met you. <laughs> I'm, I'm 62, and uh, biologically, I'm 43. Oh, and great! So, so we have the capacity if we know what to do to regulate our our aging process. And and often, what we see is abnormal aging. It's not actual mm-hmm. right. the, a, a necessary consequence of getting older. You know, we all get older, but we don't have to age in the same way. So, what have you learned for yourself personally, and also from the science about how we need to think about our our longevity and actually turning the clock back. Okay. Well, first of all, I remain skeptical of life extension. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to be able to do much about extending the human lifespan. I think it's relatively fixed. But So I would say rather we should focus on being healthy as we age. And, you know, the real problem, the real question is, is it necessary to get sick as you get older? You know, we yes. see that when people get past the age of 60, 65, a lot of them develop heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases, cancer. Is that inevitable? And I think it's not. I think it yeah. is possible to separate the aging process from age-related disease. So then the goal is to live long and well and have a rapid drop-off at the end. So, <laughs> uh, you know, and there's a, the technical term for that is compression of morbidity. Yeah. So you're trying to squeeze the time of disability and decline at the end of life into as short a period as possible. And I think you do that by uh, applying all of the methods that we know that in all the lifestyle methods that we know that influence health as you go through yeah. life, starting with diet, getting adequate rest and sleep, regular physical activity, uh, attending to stress, you know, all of these things that we know about. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think the you know, the, the work by Dan Buettner, as we mentioned earlier, has really helped us identify what are the default mechanisms in these cultures where they live yeah. to be 100. I mean, you know, maybe, well, you know, we the upper limit, it was 122 of the oldest lived person, right? right? Yeah. But, but, you know, most of us potentially could get to 100 if we took away a Absolutely. lot of the insults. Right. Now that we've yeah. dealt with infectious disease mostly and we've dealt with the sanitation, we've dealt with the vaccination <laughs> diseases, yeah. and now we have the opportunity if we actually shift into a way of living that creates health that actually now there are a lot of centenarians around these days you know they used to be yeah. quite rare but now there yeah. are a lot of them but if you look at them most of them are sick you know yeah. most of them are not doing that well yeah and and that's not the goal i mean you don't want to just live to a high number you want to live and and be able to enjoy life and feel good so exactly you know that that's the real challenge is how do you stay well as you get older I, th- I think that's right. And I think, you know, I was in Sardinia last summer and I met this guy, Pietro, who was 95. and just stopped his shepherding work at 95 <laughs> and was hiking five miles every day up and down the mountains. He was bolt upright, booming voice, clear eyes. I'm like, wow, you're 95 years old. And, and you know, he was sitting there chatting with his friends and had been eating their traditional diet for years and doing natural activities and built the community. And so, all those were defaults. And we've lost all those defaults. We're all isolated and lonely. We mm-hmm. eat crap food. We don't move our bodies. Uh, we're under chronic stress. There was a guy named Silvio I met in Sardinia. I said, Silvio, tell me, he was a, a shepherd and he was living on the top of this mountain. And I think his family had been there for thousands of years. And I said, Silvio, you know, do you, do you have any stress? And he kind of looked at me like I was kind of a little funny question. 
Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, stress, like where things are difficult or he's like, oh, and he thought for a minute. He goes, well, sometimes at night when a goat gets out, I have to go get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh God, <laughs> that's stress, right? Yeah. Right. So I, I think we are just so inundated with so many insults and it, it takes a kind of a heroic effort to, to redesign your life to actually create the conditions for having your health span equal your lifespan, which is mm-hmm. what you're talking about. Yep. I mean, the average person in America, I think the last 17 years of their life are spent in health, poor health and disability. So if you live to be 60, you're, maybe your health span is 60, but the next 20 years, you're, you have no health. And that's, that's not good. Yeah. Now, when you look at some of these people that are old and doing well, they're all over the map. You can find some who smoke and drink immoderately. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I <laughs> talked to one Russian woman who was 103, I think, and was asked yeah. about the secret of her longevity. She said, I never eat vegetables. So <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But, you know, I think one of the commonalities that I see is like, uh, very good social connections, yes. Uh, social yes. and intellectual connections as you go through life. I think in our culture, an awful lot of older people become isolated. That's probably mm-hmm. gotten much worse during the pandemic. Uh, but you know, social isolation, I think, is is a great underminer of of health and healthy longevity. Yeah, and no, I think I might have read it in your books, but like if you belong to a bowling club or a knitting club, yep. or it, like yep. it doesn't matter what, what it is, that as long as you right. belong yep. uh, to something and have some connection and it, it actually creates some kind of downstream effects. And, you know, I, I think the science of this is fascinating. Uh, I don't know if you've dug into this whole research around sociogenomics, uh-huh, which is no, the p- power of our social connections to influence our, our immune system and our gene expression. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you know about the work that in, of entrainment, right? Where you, yes, yeah. Which I think I read you wrote about, it, which is where if you're in a room with someone, you're having a heart-centered connection and you're both wired up to EKG and EEG, you can literally see the other person's heartbeat huh. in the other person's brain, uh-huh. right? And so I think there's, there's so much to this that we're just beginning to understand about the, 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 the biology of these social connections. And it's not, it's not just an abstract idea. There's, there's always a mechanism underneath it. Absolutely. Uh, I saw research from Japan, which nobody here knows about, showing that laughter can actually uh, it, turn off uh, genes involved in prostate cancer. Wow. Uh, amazing. I mean, now that talk about a mind body interaction. I mean, that's yeah. laughter and genes. It's powerful. Yeah. And well, you mean, you know, you, you knew Norman Cousins. Uh, yes. And I think his book, The Anatomy of an Illness, also really influenced me when I was in my 20s. Yeah, same. And, and he had ankylosing spondylitis, which is an autoimmune disease, and, and decided he wasn't going to take the advice of his doctor, but he was going to watch Laurel and Hardy movies and the Marx Brothers. Yeah, and he laughed. laughed laughed his way to good health. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was great. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's so powerful. And, and for you, Andy, what are the things that you incorporate in your life now? I don't, I don't even know how old you are because you look the same as you did when I met you 30 years ago. But <laughs> I'm going to be 80 in a couple months. No, amazing. Yeah. God, you look mazel tough. You look fantastic. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so so your obviously mind is bright, your skin is clear, your eyes are good. I mean, what, what are you doing uh, day to day given all that you've learned in your lifetime and all the amazing access you've had to the leading edge research in how to keep healthy? Okay, what, what are you well, doing? I follow my own dietary advice. You know, I eat an anti-inflammatory diet, varied, I you know, all the things that I should be doing. I try to be physically active. Uh, I walk as my, as my favorite physical activity. Mm. Uh, I have two big dogs that take me for walks. And I think being with companion animals is a healthy strategy. Uh, I like to laugh and I like to spend time with friends and cook. Uh, I really attend to good rest and sleep. I do my breathing exercises. Um, uh, I keep engaged in the world and my teaching is certainly provides that. Yeah. I can't imagine retiring. I mean, that's just that's not, not of interest to me. Yeah. I think that's so key. I think the, the, you know, you look at the data on retirement it actually is a death sentence. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you've seen that too within six yeah. months of retiring, many men, you know, get really sick or die. Yeah. So are there any, are there any things that you do that are a little bit extra? Like I, I you've written a lot about supplements and nutritional yeah. deficiencies and, you, you know, you've recommended a lot of supplements over the years. Where are you at with that now? And what do you think, what is your thoughts about what you know, should I be You know, I take vitamin D, I take CoQ10, I take uh, an antioxidant mix, uh, I take some extra magnesium, I use a variety of mushroom supplements, which I think are really good for immune health. Um, I think that's, you know, I think that's basically what I, it. Yeah. 
And, and, you know, you, you know, there's a lot of uh, work you've done in, in, in the world of mushrooms. You've been very yes. into mushrooms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and we're, we're entering a mushroom renaissance here. Quite amazing. Uh, yeah. It's, I mean, so many friends are starting companies with mushrooms. I have a friend who started a company called Hero Diapers or Hero <laughs> Technologies, which is essentially using mycelial technology to, to digest the, the, the diaper and the poop. How great. How and, great. And it actually can eat all the plastic and landfills. It's really, yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> And, and, you know, now we're, there's a whole field of psychedelic assisted therapies yeah, yeah. and for trauma and depression and end of life therapy. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite amazing to see Paul Stamets, I know you're close with, yeah. is, is now getting a lot of attention, is creating these microdosing stacks. And how do you see the, uh, the sort of emerging research around mushrooms and both, both therapeutic mushrooms, adaptogenic mushrooms, and also um, the psychedelic mushrooms? And I want, I want well, to draw on your yeah. ethnobotany uh, sure. background to kind of give us a deep dive into this. Well, I got I got interested in the uh, therapeutic benefits of mushrooms a long time ago, and I was one of the first <laughs> people to write about them you were. and try to get people to do research on them. And I first came onto this from looking at traditional Chinese medicine, where mushrooms are highly esteemed as remedies, and there'd been almost no research in the West on them. So I think especially for immune modulation, for increasing resistance to viral infections, cancer, there's a lot there, um, yeah. you know, th that's a big area of research. The psychedelic mushrooms, this is part of the whole psychedelic renaissance that's happening now. It's long overdue, and I think it's a good thing. And it may be that, uh, you know, maybe this is the one thing that can save our culture. <laughs> uh, frankly, I think we're in so much trouble. Uh, and, you know, it may be that this is the consciousness change that can happen. Uh, it's possible. I can't, in some ways, I can't believe how it is penetrating mainstream culture. I saw yeah. an article, listen to this, I mean, this was out a month ago, in Town and Country magazine. Yeah. <laughs> of, of all things, Town and Country magazine, titled, Why is Everyone Smoking Toad Venom? Yeah. In Town wow. and Country? Wow. I mean, unbelievable. And Vogue had a cover story on psilocybin a few months ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is really out there now. And yeah. when I was traveling before the <laughs> pandemic, it didn't matter what subject I was talking on, healthy aging, anti-inflammatory diet, integrative medicine, I would get questions about psychedelics. You yeah. know, this people are curious. They want to know. They want access to it. It's happening. I, I think it's a good thing. And, and how, do you, how do you think that... Um you know, this, this, this movement is going to end up, I mean, you think, you think we're going to legalize it. Do you think it's going to be part of our traditional medical therapies for chronic conditions? I mean, yeah, I think we're going to see, first of all, you know, I think MDMA will be made available for post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, psilocybin for drug resistant depression, you know, a few other things like this. Uh, I think there will be more and more people trained in how to use psychedelic therapy. So that's one movement that's going to happen. The other is, I think, just penetration of the general culture that people are going to be microdosing and experimenting. So mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how it's going to play out. And I have some worries about, you know, are big companies going to try to take it over and control it? I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, there's like a lot of public companies that are now investing in psychedelic research, yeah. mushroom technologies. You know, I, I think Paul, Paul Stamets, I heard him speak recently, and he talked about the work he's doing around dementia and Alzheimer's using yep. microdosing and yep. using a stack of lion's mane and psilocybin and niacin. And, niacin. And, yeah. and, and it's fascinating research to show the really impact on these neurodegenerative mm -hmm. diseases. How do you think that's working? I, I don't think we know enough yet. I don't think we have enough data. There's not, but, but it's <laughs> promising. It's a promising area of research. So I think we should follow it and see what happens. And, and you, you said something very provocative, which is if, if basically if, if all Americans took mushrooms, <laughs> that magic <laughs> mushrooms, that everything would shift. And why do you say that? And what does it do to the brain? And how does it change our perceptions in ways that shift things toward you know, a more- There's an awful lot of world? experiential evidence of people having uh, very radical shifts in how they perceive the world and their relationship mm -hmm. to it as a mm -hmm. result of psychedelic experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think some people become very aware of the environmental crisis and how their behavior influences it, um, mm -hmm. or their connection with nature, connection with other people. You know, we, we need a change in consciousness if we're going to avoid disaster. You yeah. know, things seem to be heading in a very bad direction on all fronts. And I think the only thing that can avert it is a change in consciousness. And 
the only agents that I see out there that have the potential to do that are psychedelics, not just mushrooms, it, all of them. Yeah, it's really true. And I, I think it got such a bad rap, uh, but it was really a key part of psychiatric research back in the 50s. Yep. And Michael Pollan did a great job in yep. how to change your mind about mapping out you know, how that's all yeah. unfolded and why we got so sidetracked and now it's all coming back. And I, I you know, I don't know about you, but I, I, I would say the experiences I had in college and I, now I think it's okay to talk about it. Yeah, people, sure. <laughs> most right. people not say yeah. anything about, but you know, I, I definitely had the experience of it. This was in the seventies and, and it was a thing. And I remember always doing it in a sort of a sacred container mm -hmm. of nature with friends, not just going to parties yeah. and taking a bunch of drugs, but actually having a very intentional experience. And it really profoundly affected the way I saw the world, the way I saw myself, what mattered to me, understanding the intersection and connectivity between things. I think you, you and I are very similar in that way. We both, we see the patterns in the data. We see the way yeah. things are connected. We see sort of the ecological view. You're an ecological doctor. I think that's really the, what, what, what we're doing is ecological yeah. medicine. Yeah. And, and I think that, that hugely influenced me and, and started to shift my thinking towards more of this kind of medicine. Was, was that something that happened to you? I know you went to South America, you had all these yeah, experiences. Yeah, but I did. You I, you know, I, I began experimenting with psychedelics when I was in college uh, long ago. That was a Timothy and, Leary, Richard Alpert yeah, era, right? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but yes, I think a profound, a profound influence on my way of thinking and my way of thinking about medicine. And what, what, what happened? What were some of the experiences that you had? Well, I think some of it was really seeing very graphically how what was inside my head was connected with what was outside my head and that I could yeah. change things out there by changing things in here. Yeah. It's, it's so powerful. And, and then there's a whole other class, I think, that are now also mushrooms that are arising that um, are therapeutic mushrooms that we really haven't taken advantage of, uh, that I, I've been using a lot more personally than I'm using my patients with cordyceps, reishi, maitake, shiitake, you know, um, lion's, lion's mane. mane. Yeah. 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 All these incredible mushrooms. But that, these that have been shaga. long used in Asian medicine and Japanese mm. medicine, Chinese medicine, Korean medicine, and mm. they've been extremely valued and they've been unknown in our part of the world until recently. Yeah. So I think they're and, good and, to incorporate into the diet, the edible ones, and to consider taking us supplements it's true i useful. actually eat a lot of mushrooms i eat you know Good shiitake thing. and maitake mushrooms you yeah. know you can buy yeah. a whole variety of mushrooms not those little white button mushrooms which yeah that's that the only thing we had available for <laughs> years and now suddenly we have all these new mushrooms available yeah and it's and they, they the science behind them is quite impressive you know lion's mane helps the brain heal and yeah yeah, there's a there's a very very robust body of research accumulating now on these mushrooms. They were ignored for so long. Do you take any of the supplemental mushrooms? As I do powders or I, I take capsules of uh, mostly capsules of uh, lion's mane, cordyceps. Yeah, yeah. I, I I actually make a smoothie in the morning and I have the powders. And I just mix all of the different mushrooms in my smoothie and I don't really notice it. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> great. But some yeah. of them taste great too. You know, as you know, maitake, yeah. shiitake, these are delicious uh, yeah. edible mushrooms. And there's so, companies like uh, Four Sigmatic that now you can make yeah. mushroom teas. And yeah. a lot of companies are emerging that are, are, yeah, are making this, this stuff thing. really quite accessible. A good thing. So uh, what's, your, what's, your, what's, your, what's your dreams and goals for yourself for the next 30, 40 years? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's extremely optimistic. <laughs> well, you know, I, don't know. I, I want to see, uh, you know, I want to see the field of integrative medicine get on a very solid footing. I've always said one day we'll be able to drop the word integrative. It just be yes. good medicine, and yeah. uh, you know, that maybe that's not that far away. I'd be very happy to see that. Yeah, I think that's great, and I think you know, you you are are such an important figure in healthcare, and uh, unfortunately. You know, it takes so many decades for things to change. And you've yeah. just been at this for, gosh, now five decades. <laughs> well, I feel lucky that I've been able to see these changes in my lifetime because I think a lot of people, you know, don't, don't get to live to see the effects of their work. And, you know, I do. So it makes me very happy. Yeah, it's great. And, I, and again, I said, yeah, you, you influenced me so deeply and helped me get on this path and helped me realize great. there was a path yeah. and, and you were sort of catalytic and, you know, Instead of following your footsteps at Canyon Ranch felt really awesome for me. And it was just, it was just so beautiful um, to actually have that support of your mm -hmm. perspective as a foundation for, for stepping uh, out of the traditional sort of format of healthcare. And, well, thanks, and I don't, for telling, thanks for telling I don't, me that. <laughs> yeah, I don't, think, I don't think I'd be Dr. Mark Hyman if I wasn't, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't for you. <laughs> I don't know if you know this story, but I was, I was um, asked to help as a on-call doctor for Canyon Ranch in Lenox many years ago mm -hmm. in the early 90s. And 
I didn't really know about it. I'd never visited the property, but they said, well, you can use this, you know, the health resort and the, you can use the spa and you can use the, the fitness facilities. I'm like, okay, it's got like a gym membership. So I started it. And then I was at the local bookstore here in Lenox and I was buying spontaneous healing. Uh, and this woman, Christine Huffman, came up to me who had a tag on this at Canyon Ranch. And she's like, oh, um, that's a great book. You know, I know Andy Wiles. I was like, yeah, I just got on the call schedule at Canyon Ranch. You want to, she's like, you want to come over and take a tour? I'm like, sure. So I went over and talked to, talked to about my vision for healthcare and medicine and, you know, how important your influence was on me and the thinking I wanted to be doing around integrative medicine. And, and she's like, well, why don't you come for a tour? So I came for a tour. And next thing I know, she offers me a job <laughs> as the medical director after I met the owners. And, and that was the sort of the beginning of my career in this whole field. So you had uh -huh. a lot to do with that. That was it. great. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. <laughs> yeah. So, so Andy, you know, you went to Harvard in the sixties, you were in the era of, of, you know, the sort of sixties revolution. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you had a different way of thinking about things and, and something led you to kind of take a left turn and, and not pursue the traditional medical path. And you went to South America and you discovered some things that set you on the career you're on. So take us through that story briefly and tell us you know, how you got inspired to do that and what happened and, and, and what you were led to come to think about. Well, I think I took a left turn long before I went to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was always interested in plants and that led me to be a botany major as an undergraduate ah. at Harvard, which was a very unusual choice of major in those days. And uh, that gave me a unique perspective when I entered medical school. Uh, you know, I was really tuned into the natural world and it was a real shock to find that the people teaching me pharmacology in medical school knew nothing about the plant sources of the drugs that they were teaching about, you know, much less about how they differed from isolated compounds. And also, I had a longstanding interest in the mind and how the mind influenced the body. And I tried to mm. study that as an undergraduate, but it was not possible in those days. And the mind was simply left out of the equation in, in medical school, as you know. Yeah. Um, when I finished my uh, internship in San Francisco in 1969, I decided I didn't want to practice the kind of medicine that I had learned. Uh, first, because I saw it do too much harm, uh, mostly mm. in the form of adverse drug reactions. Yeah. And secondly, because it really didn't equip me to keep people healthy. You know, I learned nothing about health, healing, uh, how to keep people from getting sick. And I thought that <laughs> should a, be my main function as a doctor. <laughs> wow. That's the way that you just said that basically in medical school, you learn nothing about how to keep people healthy, which is right. such a statement, right? I know. <laughs> and much less have time or incentive to keep myself healthy, you know, going through medical school. Uh, anyway, uh, I dropped out of medicine. I made my living for a number of years as a writer. I found ways to travel around the world, as you mentioned, uh, looking at uh, other kinds of medical systems and medical practice. I spent time with shamans. I was interested in psychoactive plants and drugs and uh, foods and other cultures. So I did that for about three and a half years. I saw a lot of interesting stuff. And then my car broke down in Tucson in 1973. <laughs> <laughs> and I never left. I never would have thought that I'd be living here. But it turned out the person I had most to learn from was in Tucson. And he'd actually been oh. here the whole time and I didn't know about him. And that was a, an old the osteopathic fish. Yeah, osteopath. Robert, Robert Fulford. 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 He was yeah. in his 80s when I met him. And I think was the most effective healer I've ever met. He used hands-on manipulation, no equipment. He charged $35 for a visit. Uh, <laughs> he didn't say much, but it was so good to be worked on by him. And people would say, when should I come back? And he'd say, you don't have to come back. You're fixed. And yeah. uh, he also would say things like, you know, you just make these adjustments and let old mother nature do her work. Yeah. Anyway, I saw him affect remarkable cures of everything from recurrent ear infections in kids to chronic GI conditions. And uh, he really made me aware of the healing power of nature. Again, mm. something missing from my medical education. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how possible it was to use low-tech medicine uh, to produce, you know, to facilitate healing. So that, that was a revelation to me. And I began, um, giving talks to medical students and, uh, I, I began lecturing at, in the medical school on alternative medicine. Nobody even knew what alternative medicine was in those days. And, yeah. uh, you know, nobody knew the difference between an osteopath and a chiropractor, for example. That's right. Yeah, I'm sure you yeah. remember. I remember. Uh, I remember the Holistic Health Handbook, which kind of yes, right, was the right. first sort of, it was like published in the 70s. And I yep. studied, I took a course in Holistic Health 
at Goddard yeah. College in a summer program. And we had this handbook that had everything from crystals to osteopathy yep. to yep. homeopathy. It was very interesting. Yeah. And there was a holistic medical movement in Arizona, as I'm sure there was in other parts of the country, but no doctors were members of it. It was nurses, mm. psychologists, social workers. Uh, and for through the 70s, I was talking, began writing about my ideas about health. No, none of my medical colleagues paid any attention to me. You know, I got a larger and larger following in the general public, but really no one in medicine cared about what I was saying. And that didn't change until the early 1990s. Uh, yeah. That was when Jim Dolan came to be dean of the medical college. But it was the time when the economics of healthcare began to go south. Mm. And the conclusion that I draw from that is that no amount of ideological argument moves anything. It's only when yeah. the, pocket, <laughs> the pocketbooks of institutions get squeezed. Yeah that they begin yeah. to open to uh, new ideas. So I was calling what I did natural and preventive medicine, and then I came to use the term integrative medicine, which seemed to be more uh, acceptable. Yeah. And the whole idea was that there are all these modalities out there mm -hmm. that are incredibly effective, that have basically been in the diaspora of healthcare for yeah. centuries, and right. maybe actually be central to the, this most important idea that we've ignored, which is how do we create health? Yep. Not how do we and how disease. do we facilitate healing, which I think you know comes from within. But yeah, there's right. also a lot of nonsense out there, and I think the uh, the job of people in integrative medicine is to sift through it all and sort out what is useful and sensible from what isn't. Well, you know, you've catalyzed literally millions and millions and millions of dollars of research mm -hmm. on integrative medicine by bringing yep. it into academia and saying, "Look, there's value here. Let's look at it. Whether it's acupuncture." And you spawned a whole generation of doctors, uh, from Brian Berman to uh, Tracy Gaudet, who worked at the VA. Yeah. I mean, she yeah. tried to get me to come and, and, and run your program in Arizona, because <laughs> I, was, I was at your program in 1997 at Canyon Ranch. We had a week-long program there. And you had the white beard there. You looked the same. You don't look any different than you did. <laughs> That's what people tell me. <laughs> <laughs> like 30 years ago. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> it's like you've sort of frozen in time. Right. And, and, the, and so Tracy tried to get me to work for you. She ended up you know, running the VA. Yeah. Now she's running the Whole Health Institute for Alice Walton, where they funded yeah. $200 million. You're building right. a new medical school. Uh, you, you've got so many people that I know that are in my network that have, have been your students who now are actually driving the future change. And I, I imagine that's got to be so satisfying for you to see. It's like, you, you know, you're, you're just not this guy at the end of the road in some ranch in Tucson <laughs> who's telling people to go to the osteopath. You've literally <laughs> catalyzed an entire transformation in healthcare. Yeah. Next week on the 16th of March, we are having a groundbreaking at the university for our new building for our center, Amazing. which is a big milestone. And wow. I'm very proud of the accomplishments of, our, it's now called the Andrew Weil Center, which I, fi I find it hard to bring myself to say. It's the Andrew <laughs> Weil Center of the University of Arizona in integrative medicine. But we now have graduated, I think, uh, upwards of 2,500 physicians from our intensive fellowship, and they're in all specialties, all ages. And then we have, uh, we're training residents. We, I think 100 residencies have now put our curriculum uh, into the residency training in a number of different fields. I think it's a, re it's a realistic goal that one day every practitioner will have had basic education and nutrition and mind-body medicine and the strengths and weaknesses of these other medical systems. It's true. I think, I think the new generation of doctors is really changing. I, I'm reached yeah. out to all the time, as I'm sure you are, by people who want to go to medical school, who are in medical school or residency, yeah. who are like, I don't like this. This is not what I want. What's out there? And they want support and guidance. And I think it's so important. I, I'd love you to talk about, you know, this book, Spontaneous Healing, was so influential mm -hmm. for me. And it talked about the healing power of nature and the healing mm -hmm. power of the body and how to activate that. And, and as we share, we both went to medical school and we didn't take a course on creating health 101. It just didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and yet it, it's so central because when you learn how to activate the body's own healing mechanisms, the body knows what to do. And most diseases can be taken care of by providing the right conditions. And the science yeah, of creating absolutely. health is, central, is so central to integrative medicine. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. The body is so objective that it does not know the difference between the real life experience that's creating that emotion and the emotion that person is fabricating by thought or memory alone. The body's believing it's living in the same past experience yeah. <laughs> seven